Hello students, in this short PowerPoint we are going to review some fundamental basics of right triangle trig, but we're going to do so through an integrated perspective, meaning we're going to combine together and connect many different views. When students think of right triangle trig, they think firstly of a right triangle and then the relationships between those various sides, and they set up ratios. That is one vantage point. But another key and critical vantage point is its relationship to the unit circle and how those values that are on the opposite and adjacent side originated from our unit circle values and through having right triangles inscribed there. Lastly, we want to make sure that students can connect what they're seeing on a unit circle to the xy coordinate plane and the graphs that emerge when we graph just a sine function, a cosine function on that xy coordinate plane. So today we're going to look at the connection between all three of those and my hope is that you would be able to articulate that connection because that's something you want to take into your classroom so you can empower your students and give them a holistic understanding of trigonometry. But of course we begin with a simple introduction by looking at the six basic trig ratios sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant and we do so by labeling an angle and then once that angle is selected, we label the sides opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. Now, though the actual numerical values of sine, cosine, tan, cosecant, secant, and cotan will change based on what your angle is, the ratios themselves are always the same. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tan is opposite over adjacent, and then you have the reciprocals of all three of these listed in their respective order. The reciprocal of sine is cosecant. We see it's flipped, hypotenuse over opposite. And then we have the same thing occurring for cosine and secant and for tangent and cotangent. Whenever teachers are introducing right triangle trig, they often point out that there are some special right triangles that have some set relationships. And those two are the 30-60-90 and the 45-45-90 or your right isosceles. For 30, 60, 90, how do the side lengths relate? Well, if you know your short side, the hypotenuse is twice that length, and the long side is the square root of 3 times that length. When you go ahead and calculate them, for cosine of 30, you would get square root of 3 over 2. For sine of 30, you get 1 half. And for tan of 30, you get square root of 3 over 3. Now let's come over here to our isosceles right. Well, obviously your adjacent and opposite sides are the same length because they, uh, this is an isosceles triangle. How does the hypotenuse relate? It's just the square root of 2 times the value of the side length. When you go ahead and you apply your ratios, cosine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2, and the sine of 45 degrees is the same as square root of 2 over 2, and your tangent is 1. Now, if you've already done a unit circle, representation for your students, they're looking at these values and they're going to say, okay, I understand you want me to memorize these ratios, but they look awfully familiar. This is a great point for you to make that connection to the unit circle and say, yes, you are right. You have seen these values before. Where are they coming from? They are your XY values on the unit circle. If we were to drop a perpendicular from 45 degrees, and let's pretend that this is a 45 degree angle over here, then we have made an isosceles right triangle and we just saw in the previous screen that our cosine is the square root of 2 over 2, sine is square root of 2 over 2, those correspond to x and y. And we saw the same thing for the 30, 60, 90 and if we drop perpendiculars from this 60 degree or this 30 degree, we would see the same relationships exist. So the students can then make that connection that, oh, x is cosine, sine is going to be y. And honestly, if you had them go ahead and drop the perpendicular here and just go ahead and use the Pythagorean theorem to find out the length of the hypotenuse, or the hypotenuse here, they're going to square the square root of 2 over 2, and they're going to square the square root of 2 over 2, and they are going to get one <laughs> once they use Pythagorean theorem and is that not what the radius has to be here because that is a unit circle so they're going to see that even though you have this memorized format they get the same answer through using 
the Pythagorean theorem. But the most important thing to underscore is that these values didn't emerge out of thin air. These relationships didn't emerge out of thin air. They came from the values on the unit circle and through examining the relationships that exist from them. So that's a very important connection for you to make with your students. Another important connection for them to make is how the sine and cosine change as you are moving along the unit circle in a counterclockwise direction. And the best way to do this is with the animation. So you see that I have the sine um, labeled here in dark red, cosine and dotted red. Of course, all six are labeled here, but I just want you to pay attention to sine and cosine. So we're going to go ahead and animate this. Now we see when we come down and start here at zero degrees, sine um, would be zero here, but as we start to pull it up, it's short. And as we move along this unit circle all the way up to where sine would be its tallest, which would be a one up here since it's on the unit circle, that why our sine gets bigger. Sine gets bigger as we move up. What happened to cosine? Cosine was long when we were over here, but as we move up, it gets shorter. So sine is increasing from zero to 90 degrees. Cosine is decreasing. That is something you want students to examine all the way around that circle so they can establish the relationship. In addition, you want them to consider the signs of cosine and sine. If they know that cosine is x, sine is y, and they've established that relationship, then it's very easy to use what they know from signs in each quadrant and to then identify how those relate to um, sine, cosine, and tangent here. I've highlighted in red just your three most basic ones. Um, those are the ones I want you to have committed to memory. And of course, your students should have all six of them, especially if they're in um, pre-calc. But when students take the ACT, for instance, they really, really hone in on the signs of cosine, sine, and tangent in each of these quadrants, and students knowing the signs that would emerge for the tangent as a result of that. So it's going to be something that you want to know at like the back of your hand because your students are going to need to know that. The next question then becomes, how does what we just examined in terms of the magnitude of sine and cosine as we move on, along that unit circle and their signs how does that relate to these function graphs when we just graph sine, when we just graph cosine on the x-y axis? What relationship does the unit circle have with these? Take a second and examine them, and then we'll talk about it. Well, it looks like our unit circle has been pulled apart and flattened, <laughs> and we have our rating or degree measures as indicated on the x-axis. What are the y values? How are we getting this curve? Well, we know y is sine values. So the actual points that would emerge along this would be the sine values at each of these radian measures. So this would be pi over 2. Remember, that's where we said sine gets the highest. That's why it's 1. When is sine the lowest? Well, its greatest negative value is negative 1. That's at 3 pi over 2. And then we know that it um, is its lowest at both pi and 2 pi. That's why it's hitting um, 0. And then this pattern repeats over and over. Neither sine nor cosine is going to go outside the bounds of 1 and negative 1 because it's on a unit circle, and the radius never gets bigger than 1. So that's why we see both of them within those bounds. Now, cosine is going to be a little bit different because we know that um, cosine, your x value, is going to be its biggest at 1, but by the time you get up to pi over 2, which is right here, that's when it's 0. And then it's going to get um, its largest in a negative capacity heading out toward negative 1 at negative pi. So they both um, have an, a period that's the same, though they're positioned differently on the x-y axis. One splendid way for you to draw the connection between the unit circle and um, the graph of each trig function is through animation. I'm going to animate the sine wave here based on what students would be seeing in a unit circle and um, by having right triangles superimposed there, you could do the same thing with a cosine. And then if you wanted to move on and do it with tan, 
I, I think just sticking with sine and cosine is good enough and the students get the point. But let's examine it. So we start at zero degrees in the sine, which is this green side. It gets its biggest up here and it starts to decrease. Now it's mat, its length is large, but in a negative capacity. So that's why we're down underneath the x-axis until we hit the bottom, in which case we see y or sine increasing all the way up to here. And it decreases again all the way to here because it's getting smaller and taking on larger negative values. And then it increases, taking on smaller negative, but then very large and larger positive values. And then it repeats again. So this is a beautiful way and a very simple way to show students the connection between the sign values on the unit circle and the curve that emerges on the xy axis. Next, what you would want students to do is to make their own connections between values that are on the xy axis for functions of sine and cosine and values that are on the unit circle. This really helps them to integrate the two together. So let's look at this one. Explain the relationship between the coordinates a, b, c, and d marked on the graph y equals sine of t and y equals cosine of t and the quantities a, b, and c marked in the diagram of the unit circle below. Okay, so one thing we can pick out right away is that C and A have to be the same. They're coming out, they're slightly more than two. Okay, now we know that on this xy axis, the values that you get for y, which would be b and d respectively, are a function of whatever this radian measure is. So think about that. A and C are the same. They're your input. They're your radian measure. What's your radian measure down here? It's C. So little c and a have to equal the angle measure C. So that's one very important connection. What are the outputs here? Well the outputs on the sine curve is the sine value at A and on the cosine D is the cosine value at C or the cosine of C. Okay, so let's come over here. A and B are X and Y, which are cosine and sine, right? So um, A, which is our cosine value, would be D. And think about that. You're in the second quadrant. What is the value of an X value in the second quadrant? It's negative. Is D negative? Yes, it is. So that's a connection there. A is negative, D is negative. They are equal to one another. B, that's your sine value on the unit circle. And in the second quadrant, sine, which is Y, would be positive. And lo and behold, our little b is also positive. But we have that B equals big B. So it's so important that they establish the qualities that exist between the unit circle and the values on the X, Y axis for cosine and sine again, in order to, to develop that integrated perspective. Here's a full explanation of the solution that we found in the previous problem. Um, and again, the purpose of this task is simply to help students make the connection between, between the graphs of sine of t and cosine of t and the x and y coordinates of the points moving around the unit circle. You just want students to be able to match coordinates of points on the graph with coordinates and angles in the diagram of the unit circle. This requires some abstract thinking. It requires deep connections and analysis. And it really requires students to work at the higher end of Bloom's taxonomy. It's going to be a higher cognitive demand for them, but it's so important, again, that you draw this connection or when they see just sine and cosine curves and they see the unit circle, they view them in isolation from one another, not realizing the deep connections. So, um, and we want our students to have that because it makes math more fruitful for them and less ambiguous. So that wraps up everything for this brief intro. We will look at some applications of right triangle trig in the next PowerPoint.